Hello everyone and thank you for coming for my session. Um, today we're going to talk about code performance for Python internals. I actually didn't know that DevOx is so much Java focused, so I assume you're all those that want some refreshment from all the Java talks. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy. Uh, my name is Jonathan Goldschmidt. I'm from Granulate uh, and from Israel, by the way, made uh, the long trip here. A bit about myself, I like everything about computers and software. I got most of my experience uh, serving in the ADF as a software developer. And today I'm a research team lead at Granulate's uh, performance research department. Uh, Granulate's main product is a continuous uh, real-time optimization solution. Um, and it enables companies to optimize the workload, improve performance, and leverage that to reduce cost. To do that, we study the performance of many frameworks, runtimes, and environments. And today, I'm going to share some of what I've learned about Python. Now, I don't want to bum you, although, well, you're most Java folks, so you might be happy <laughs> from this picture. Uh, but the internet is full of these things, which let you see that Python, well, sucks in performance. Uh, but we're not doomed. There's many, we have many options to improve the performance of our code. Well, we can use different frameworks, such as, I don't know, Namba, which helps you write uh, more efficient or faster code that deals with uh, mathematics. And we can use AsyncIO for code that makes uh, better use of than, than threads for concurrency. Uh, we can use profilers uh, that lets you that let you identify code bottlenecks and other issues. We can use alternative Python implementations such as PyPy, which might be faster for your use case. And we can always improve our code, write better algorithms, and use uh, better data structures. However, we will not be talking about any of these. We will focus Python itself, uh, and by that I mean C Python and version 3.10. So what is Python itself? Uh, when I say that, I actually mean the Python interpreter, or, or more generally, the Python runtime and everything that comes inside. Everything that takes your code, your Python text code, this small function, uh, converts it to the Python bytecode, and executes it. Sorry? The light. Yeah. Um, can we? Or I don't think I control it for my laptop. Can we turn off one of these lights? Maybe this one? Mm, I'm not sure I can control it for my laptop. Oh. Well, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, by saying the Python interpreter, I mean from the code that transforms my text to the Python bytecode and other components in the Python runtime, such as the garbage collector, um, the import machinery, and etc. cetera. Uh, now, why should I care about a Python runtime? This is not specific to Python. It's relevant to all uh, high-level languages, also for Java and for Node.js, and we will see some examples of them later. But the Python interpreter, this runtime, it takes your code and it tries to run it as fast as possible. Uh, and it has a set of rules and many, many optimizations inside. And if your code behaves well with those rules and those optimizations, it will run faster. And if it doesn't behave well, well, the runtime and the interpreter will run it slower than it could be. Uh, the interpreter is our friend. and. We, in this talk, we will see some examples of how we can like, help it do a better job. Um, so I prepared some demos, uh, which we'll now go through. They're all Python-based, uh, because I know Python best. And they're all revolving about dictionaries, which are a key component in Python, not only used as data structures in your application, but also used inside the runtime itself. For example, global variables, as we will see later, are implemented with dictionaries. And instance attributes on classes are also dictionaries-based. Uh, feel free to stop me during the demos uh, if you have any question. We'll go through lots of information. And I don't expect you to remember anything. It's supposed to be fun and like intriguing and showing you how small things, small bits in the interpreter can have massive effects on your code if you don't play well with them. All right. 
So the first case is about dictionary lookup types. Uh, when we write Python code, we use dictionaries, and for us as the users of Python, they all behave the same. They all behave the same, whether I use string keys, uh, numeric keys, I use classes in my, uh, as keys in my dictionaries, whether I, stores, yeah, whether I store ints or strings, they all behave the same. However, they have multiple underlying implementations which can affect the performance of how lookups, how much time lookups take. We will now see these examples. Um, I will enlarge the form. Uh, for the demos, I wrote, um, let's say, a set of tools that are available online uh, that let you introspect uh, the internals of Python dictionaries um, and print the internal state of them and their elements, etc., to view how the state uh, changes when we make changes uh, on the dictionary object. So let's start with the first example. Um, I will import the helper function. Sing, um, maybe, and enlarge it a bit more. Single right. Uh, let's create a small dictionary with string keys pointing to uh, numeric items, 100 elements. Uh, we've imported this printdict function. We can use it to print the dictionary, uh, to print its internal properties. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the lookdict function. Uh, the lookdict is the name that the Python runtime uses for the lookup function. Uh, and it has currently, as of Python 3.10, there are four different functions, uh, with different ones optimized for different use cases. Uh, about the other fields, we will go over them later. So I've created a simple dictionary with string only keys, and we can see that it uses a function called lookdict unicode no dummy. Uh, the Unicode part says that it contains only string keys, and the no dummies part says that uh, we didn't delete any key. All, all key places are set with existing elements. Uh, now we will apply a small modification on the dict. I've, okay, to benchmark, I've added a small function that iterates the dict for 10,000 times. Let's copy it and see how it performs. How the look dict uh, Unicode no dummy function performs, but, but by doing 10,000 lookups, we actually call this function 10,000 times. So we can see that it takes you know, 360 microseconds. Uh, not very stable on a laptop, <laughs> but uh, we, we can see that it's roughly, hopefully, remains in the same range. Um, keeps increasing. Um, it's all right. You will see that the, the difference will be greater once I make some modifications. Let's make a small modification. I will delete an entry, something that you might be doing on a dict. Uh, it's legit, right? We'll delete entries. And if I print it again, you can see that it has converted to the look dict unicode version. Because once I delete an entry, uh, we cannot use the most optimized function. Uh, that assumes no key slots are deleted, and we use the less optimized one, uh, that has to check for deleted entries. If we measure it again, we un I don't expect we'll see a big difference because the the difference between them is not very is not very big. Uh, but now we'll take we'll make another change. Uh, we will insert a non-string key. Also something legit with dicts. We all use dictionaries that on with non-string keys. Uh, and now. You can see that it uses the generic look dict function and not the uh, no unicode, not the unicode one. If we measure it now, I expect to see that it behaves or performs much worse. Um, well, when measured uh, on a server and not on a laptop with a varying clock speed, it should be about 20 to 30 percent slower. Uh, the reason behind that is that the op the version optimized for string lookup. Uh, can call the, the Unicode compare function directly, and it does not need to handle exceptions. Uh, when I search items for edict, um, if I use a key that is a class and overrides the dunder equal method, then this Python called get called, gets called, and it can raise exceptions. And Python has to catch these exceptions and return a key or return whatever. Um, 
when I use the look dict unicode function, I don't have any of that because string comparison never raises any exception. So it's much simpler for Python. Uh, any question? I think so. No. Okay. So uh, that's it for the first demo. Um, the thing with this example is that once a dictionary gets this change done, it is never reverted back. So even if I use, um, I have a dictionary that is used for the lifetime of my program, and just one time, I don't need actually even have to insert an element. Even if I just look up an element, I think in Python 3.9, it will also, if I just try to look up an element that doesn't exist, but I use a non-string key, it will destroy the lookup function of my dict. Uh, and you may think, well, it's not very significant. It's all like in the fraction of microseconds, milliseconds. But then again, remember that uh, about, I don't know, 10% of a typical Python program is composed of looking up through dictionaries. And if we mess them up and uh, have them use the less optimized function, then we greatly increase the, the lookup time uh, for them. And it has a visible effect on our program. That's it for the first demo. Second demo, and I will do a short brief on the structure of dictionary objects. Uh, a dictionary object that I create in Python is uh, on the C side of the interpreter, uh, is represented by an object called PyDict object. A PyDict object uh, points to a PyDict keys object, which uh, contains an array of the keys and an array of indices. Uh, when I do a lookup, uh, dictionary, uh, dictionary is our hash base, so we hash the key that we uh, want to look up. We go through the DK indices array uh, and find the index for the specific hash, and then we go to DK entries uh, and pick the right uh, entry and extract the value. Um, when we look at that, uh, we can ask, why do we need this additional PyDict keys object? Well, the reason is that in Python 3.3, uh, a concept called key sharing dictionaries was added. Uh, the reason for that is that, as I said, dictionaries are used to store instance attributes on classes. And with instance attributes, as we can see, as I, I hope you can see <laughs> in this example, uh, we have the same keys for all instances because we create many classes, but we usually store the same attributes on them. So it's a waste of like program memory to allocate the same DK indices and DK entries array uh, for each and every object. As we can see in this example, most of these, most of, uh, of the objects here are actually equal. The only thing that's different is the value, uh, which is one for x1 and two for x2. But the DK indices array is the same, and the key pointer is the same, and the PyDict keys object is the same. So, key sharing dictionaries arrived, uh, and they let you use the same uh, dict keys object, and each dictionary now can point to a separate values array and store the values, just the values there. Uh, and now the, 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 the dictionary object itself has a reference to its keys and a reference to its values, so different instances of the same class can use the same keys. Now, let's see an example of how it looks. For that, I have a fairly unorthodox example of OOP, uh, but I need it <laughs> to display the point. Um, let's see now how it looks. So we have this animal class, which has numerous uh, attributes that are shared for all types of animals, and some attributes are set only if I pass a non-none value to the constructor. So let's create a fish and call it flipper, and print the dictionary of flipper. Uh, to get the, dic the underlying dictionary object of an instance, we have the dunder dict attribute. Uh, so, we can see that uh, we know that there's the look dict function, and now we have the look dict split function, which is the fourth function that we haven't saw in the previous example. Look dict split is the one used uh, when we are using key sharing dictionaries. Uh, so we can see that its size is 104 bytes. Um, it has those entries. And now let's look at the keys section. 
Uh, this uh, represents the attributes of the PyDict keys object. And we can see that it has ref count of two. Uh, one reference comes from the flipper dictionary, and another reference comes from the animal class, which, share, which saves, uh, the, saves the, the keys object uh, for use with next, attribute, next uh, instances that I might create. Now let's create another animal, and this time it has additional attributes. I can print it now. Uh, it has the smell attribute, um, uh, and we can see that its keys. Well, I think let me restart the interpreter. I think I've <laughs> messed it by running the code before. Uh, as with the previous example, once you mess things up, they remain the same way for the lifetime of the interpreter. So I have to restart it. Let's run this thing again and create funky and print it. Okay, now it's all right. I've created funky, and funky now has keys reference of three, uh, which means that funky has one reference, and flipper the fish has one reference, and the animal class has one reference for this keys object. And we can say that its size is 104 bytes, uh, same as with the flipper object. And now, let's create another animal, Milo, the cat, and it adds another fifth attribute uh, to our uh, animal class. And if we print it now, we can see that it got messed up. Uh, we can see that by uh, one, for once, it doesn't have the look dict split function anymore, and the keys ref count is now one. What happened here is that Python had to resize the keys object because we added, we kept adding attributes uh, on different objects. And um, once Python has to resize the keys object, uh, like outside of the constructor, when our class has already multiple living instances, it just says, well, you're not using the same set of attributes for your class. So I should not keep maintaining this optimization of sharing keys between class objects. So now we can see that the dictionary size is almost tripled because it has to create a different keys object for every instance. Uh, it's also using the Unicode no dummy function, but that's roughly the same uh, performance. Uh, but the memory consumption has like, gone very high. Okay, now we can also see if, if we look at the dictionary of Another object, uh, it's still using the look dict split, but we can see that the keys ref count has gone by one, because as I said, Python has given up on using this optimization for future instances of my class. Uh, so the animal class no longer references the keys object, and it will not use it for future uh, for future uh, objects. And we can verify that by creating another fish and seeing that it doesn't use the look dict. Uh, function, the look the split function, and its size is uh, like 200 bytes instead of 100 that we have w we've had before. Uh, now we can restart the interpreter like I did before. We can also just redefine the class, uh, so Python recreates it, and we'll try again to apply this optimization on the new class. Uh, let's now create another cat. And we can print it. Uh, we print it. We can say that it's again using the look split, and everything is working back again. Uh, but now we will use the mute function. Uh, Milo, very brutal. Uh, this function merely deletes an attribute. Also something legit that you might have seen in Python code around the world. If we look at it now, we can see that it's again not shared, and well, it got its own dict keys object. And if we create the, fi the, the cat again, we can see that it's not shared either. Once I deleted an attribute for the first time, Python gives up on this optimization for all future instances of my class. Uh, and again, as with the previous example, it will not try to do so again until I either restart the interpreter or redefine the class, which basically means it's a new class. The better way to do that, uh, to write this code, would probably be just that. Uh, 
If you care about the memory footprint of objects, do not delete attributes. It doesn't help to improve the memory footprint. And always store all possible attributes on your class. Uh, and don't like store attributes only conditionally in the constructor. Um, these are, by the way, the, the two snippets from the Python source code uh, that demonstrate uh, where Python gives up on trying to keep your keys shared. Uh, the bottom one is where I delete an item, and uh, Python says, OK, if you delete, I'm not trying to maintain this sharing any anymore. And uh, to the bottom right is the sample where uh, Python says, if your keys get resized, then I allow resizing and maintaining sharing only if there's only one dictionary referring to to those keys. Uh, the reason for that is if I have an object with many, many attributes, then in my first, the, the first time my constructor runs, it does have to resize the keys object multiple times because I keep adding attributes to this instance. If I have an instance with, let's say, 50 attributes, uh, then I do resize the dictionary multiple times in my constructor, and that's allowed. But the moment I have multiple objects referring to my uh, keys object, then resizing is not allowed anymore. Um, now this optimization is seamless, but once broken, like the, sim the previous example, once broken, it is never applied again. Uh, so you need to be very cautious. Um, a word on slots, by the way, uh, which are similar optimization, very, let's say, archaic, uh, that has existed in Python since since I was born, I think, uh, or before. <laughs> uh, I'm just 27. Um, slots let you define a, a static uh, list of attributes that your class instances will use. And then each instance is not a dictionary anymore. It's just an array of items that uh, uh, belong or match uh, those in the list of static attributes that I have defined. Um, ever since the key sharing dictionaries were introduced, I personally think that slots are a waste of time. This optimization is seamless, and with slots you actually have to define um, to define and keep uh, maintaining the list of uh, used attributes. Slots do behave a bit better uh, memory-wise compared to uh, to key sharing dictionaries, but the effect is is not very the difference is not significant now besides having a vast effect on the memory consumption of objects, uh, key sharing dictionaries are also important or let's say uh, let's say it backwards uh, destroying key sharing dictionaries is uh, also important for the performance like CPU performance of your code. Uh, and I will explain on that after the next example. Um, the final one is about global variables, which, not surprisingly, are also based on dictionaries. Uh, now, globals are very, very common, and dictionaries are not very fast. So a solution was uh, sought for that. And what I'm talking about now was implemented in Python 3.8. Here I have a simple function that loads a global, and we can see that it has an opcode, an opcode in the Python bytecode called load global. Uh, and what Python added in uh, version 3.8 is something called inline cache for the load global opcode. Now, inline caches are a very, very common technique uh, for optimization in uh, language uh, engines. Um, Java hotspot has inline caches for tons of things. But this time we're talking about Python. Uh, and inline cache basically means that uh, we cache the result of an operation in the site that triggered this operation and not on the function that performs the operation itself. Uh, if I'm using func tools and it has a cache decorator and I place it on a function, then that's a cache on the function. And then inline cache would be to cache the result of the function in each individual call site that uses it. So Python has an inline cache on the load global opcode. Uh, and we will now see how it performs and behaves. Uh, the way it's implemented is something called dictionary versions. Uh, Python for each dictionary maintains something called a version. Uh, it's an incrementing number that's shared across all uh, dictionaries in the interpreter. Each time you modify, add a value, delete a value, uh, modify a value. Uh, of a dictionary, its version is incremented or 
its version is set to the global uh, dictionary versions uh, shared uh, in the interpreter and incremented by one. Uh, now, this way Python can know in a site that actually accesses a dictionary, for example, the load global opcode which accesses uh, two dictionaries, as we will see now, uh, Python can check if the version has changed since previous time I've performed this operation. And if the version hasn't changed, then we can use the cached values. Now, load global actually performs two lookups uh, in two different dictionaries. We have the global dictionary, um, which for a function is the dictionary of the model in which it was defined. Uh, we also have the built-ins dictionary, which is the dictionary that Python falls back into uh, looking in uh, if I don't find a value defined in my globals. Uh, when I call print or len or dict or any other uh, built-in uh, name defined in Python, uh, then Python first searches my globals. It won't find it there because we don't usually define functions called len or print. And then it will check the built-ins dictionary and it will find it there and uh, use that value. So when Python tries to cache the load global opcode, it has to check the version of the globals and the built-ins. Th those are the two checks in the interpreter. And if the version hasn't changed since the last time my load global opcode is run, then we can use the cached value. Now let's see the effect of breaking this cache on performance. Uh, so that will be the final demo. Um, I have defined a small function in a separate module. Um, it simply loads a global, I think, 12 or 11 times. Um, not very typical <laughs> of Python code to look like that, but it just to demonstrate uh, the example. Uh, and if passed a, a true-ish value, it will modify a global variable. Uh, by doing that, it destroy, it changes the version of the global's dictionary of this module. Um, which will flush all the caches defined for those opcodes. Uh, so, that's we don't want this one, we want this one. Yes. Okay. So, uh, let's see first how the Python bytecode looks for this function. Um, basically, many, many, many low global opcodes. Now, since I said these are inline caches, then each one of those opcodes has its own cache for the deload operation that's performed. So we have 12 opcodes, and let's see how this function uh, performs uh, when not destroying the cache. First of all, we can print the dictionary version, which is a number that should not change uh, until the dictionary itself changes. If I call, if I time this function without flashing the cache, let's see uh, how it behaves. And we'll see later that the dictionary version dis does not change because the globals uh, in this module haven't changed. So it takes uh, 170 nanoseconds. The version hasn't changed, as expected. Let's try it again. And then we'll try calling it with cache flashing. So slow. I hear it ramping up. <laughs> Okay, 190 nanoseconds. Uh, we can again see that the version hasn't changed. And now let's call it with cache flashing. Hmm, about 50% uh, slower this time. Uh, and we can see that the version changes. If I do it again, the version will change because the, the function changes the globals every time it's called. Now, what's nice about this optimization, unlike the previous two, if I run it now again, this time without flashing the cache, we'll see that it once again performs better. Uh, this optimization, unlike the two previous ones, is self-healing, which is nicer for us as developers because even if we make the mistake uh, or do something very different once, uh, which is very common for many programs that for example, during uh, initialization, they do something that they don't do in runtime. Or they, they, on, on the first few minutes of executing, they do something and then they run for you know two days without doing it again. So self-healing optimizations are much better for us as developers. 
But sadly, at least from my experience, in Python and also in Java and Node.js, most optimizations are not self-healing. So once you mess something inside the, the internal state of your engine, it will remember it forever. Um, but in this case, it works great. And uh, if I let the cache heal, it will, again, run just fine. Um, so you might be asking, again, why it's relevant for real code, because my example was very contrived. It was a function that only does load globals. Uh, and it's not very typical for Python code uh, to look like that. So here on the right, I have a file from Celery, I think, which is a Python framework for tasks, whatever. Um, I put it here just to give you like the feeling of how much code can be in one function and, and in one file. And think about it that all functions defined in this file share the same set of globals. So it's enough that you have one small function that edits one small global variable and it flushes the caches of all functions defined in the file. So you, you don't have to you know, have a very contrived or specific function that uh, modifies globals. If you have a Python code file with you know, 10,000 lines of code, um, just one function defined by one non-interesting component can mess up with the caches of all functions. Um, so yes, uh, it, is, uh, it is very, uh, let's say, messing with this cache can be very harmful for the performance of um, most typical Python code. Now, a word on other languages. Uh, I actually first gave this uh, presentation in a conference called PyTexas, so I put here some jokes about uh, if we were in Java, Texas, then I would talk about Java. Uh, and actually, in DevOps UK, I could talk about Java as well, uh, because everything we saw here is relevant for other languages as well. Not these exact concepts, because we've talked about specific uh, specific behavior of the Python interpreter, uh, but the same concepts apply. Uh, Java and Node.js and Ruby and other language runtimes and different implementations of those runtimes. Uh, PyPy has its different set of rules and different JDK implementations and, um, I, I don't know, Hotspot versus Zing might have different uh, rules as well. Uh, and the same thing is relevant. Uh, Taking Node.js, for example, actually, I, I tried to hack a small Node.js demo this morning to like display the difference uh, or display uh, how we can mess with the internal state uh, that the runtime thinks or the runtime after profiling a function um, and trying to JIT compile it. We can mess with it, its internal state to like destroy the performance. Uh, of a JavaScript function. Um, I couldn't get it running because <laughs> Node.js is more complex than Python, so uh, you need to be very intricate when you break it. Uh, I put it a read uh, written by one of the V8 developers. Uh, V8 is the JavaScript engine powering Node.js, uh, where he talks about basically these types of things, these concepts, uh, and he displays a JavaScript uh, script and he takes it to be about four times faster by applying many, many, many small optimizations like I showed here, uh, with greater effects, of course. Uh, it's very cool. And what I'm trying to say is that while we saw Python-specific examples here, these are relevant um, to you, um, whatever, whatever language runtime you're using. Um, a bit on the future of CPython. CPython is getting boosted. Uh, Ever since Python 3.10, uh, multiple core developers of Python and Guido himself, the creator of Python, uh, they are working on speeding up Python uh, in the next few major releases, uh, minor releases. Uh, so uh, they have this goal of uh, a 2x speed up in 3.11, which I'm not sure if they've reached, by three point, but 3.11 is indeed much faster. So basically, you can throw whatever I've said in this uh, session and just upgrade your Python. Um, but the thing is, the faster Python gets, the faster any language runtime gets, uh, the harder uh, will be the effect when your code breaks the assumptions of the engine. 
if Python now gets uh, much faster using many uh, small optimizations like those I've displayed here, which is basically what they're adding uh, in 3.11 and 3.12, then okay, if my code plays well with the interpreter, and then it will be faster. But if my code breaks the interpreter, then it will get back to be as slow as it used to be. So on the one hand, we can be happy uh, that Python will be faster. And on the other hand, if we don't pay attention to those and that details, then our code will get back to be very, very, very slow. Um, now some takeaways. Um, if I were to ask you about those two snippets, which one is more Pythonic and which one is faster? Uh, I think, uh, well, more Pythonic, the answer is clear. Uh, faster, I'm not sure if it's clear, but the second one is faster, although much more complex to read and much less Pythonic. I'm not telling you to unpythonize your code. Um, Python code has to be readable. Uh, we write Python code because it's fast, pure, and easy, and readability counts. Um, so I'm not telling you to, to always apply those optimizations and always think about those tricks and uh, modify your code to be as fast as possible for the interpreter. Uh, I'm just telling you to remember that these small details, they have an effect. And when you decide that you want to optimize, uh, then you can remember them and apply them to achieve better results with your code. And one final note, I assume most of you have seen this sentence before. Um, the purpose of this session was to be fun and in interactive and like to give you intriguing examples of how the internals of an engine can affect your code's performance. Uh, I'm not telling you to go ahead and apply them on your code. It's probably a waste of time. You need to profile if you want to um, if you want to optimize. Do not apply those optimizations on your code without profiling. Um, oh, by the way, one of Granulite's product happens to be a free and open source uh, continuous profiler, uh, which also works with Python and Java. Uh, so you can try it out if this talk made you a bit more interested about the performance world. I'll give a link for that at the end. Um, I think that's it. Any questions? Yes. Uh, thanks for the talk. I have one question about when uh, the cost of uh, switching the implementation of, like the first part was you, you show benchmarks when it's like before and after. Mm -hmm. But what happens when actually it's happening that Python realizes that they have to switch the, the strategy, right? Is there any cost? Like, let's say you have huge, huge, like, uh, array, like a lot of data. Does it affect you, know, you have to copy anything in that? That's no, no, no. Nothing is copied. Actually, we can just, I can show the code of what's exactly happening, I think. Um, oh, right here. In the start of the look dict unicode no dummy function, it checks if the key is not a unicode object, it just switches the lookup function and gets back to the default implementation. The cost, is, the lookup function is just a pointer. The underlying structure, uh, memory wise, is the same uh, for all implementations. That's, by the way, not true uh, if we were to talk about, uh, let's say, Node.js, which has about, I think, 20 different implementations for the, their map or uh, the object type in. Uh, in V8, uh, and they have different implementations with different underlying memory structure. So in that case, yes, uh, getting it to change as a cost uh, to copy objects around. But in Python, it's just switching the pointer. No, no effect. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? All right. Then thank you. Uh, and one last thing. Uh, I saw on my flight here, there was a talk given at PyCon US uh, this year, uh, which was very similar to this one. I, I don't recall the name of who gave it, uh, but he, he talked about very, very similar concepts. Uh, again, mostly about dictionaries, because they are a painful part <laughs> in the Python uh, environment. Um, you can check it out if you're interested. Uh, if you liked uh, what I showed here. And I have in GitHub uh, the code samples uh, for those dictionary helper functions. 
That's it. Thank you.